but welcome. Happy Friday. Okay. People seem to be getting in. Awesome. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Kerfoot, the Deputy Director of Events for Politics and Prose, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. This event is part of our Dublin Voices series, celebrating the best new Irish literature, and we'd like to thank our partners at the I Embassy of Ireland, Solis Nua, and Georgetown's Global Irish Study Program for their support tonight. I will be dropping links in the chat in just a bit, so you can purchase a copy of today's book, Notes from an Apocalypse, as well as Jenny Offel's latest novel, Weather. So just look out in the chat for those throughout the program. Also, you can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button, which is found at the bottom of your screen. And we ask that you put your questions there instead of the chat, just so we can kind of keep them all in the same place so that Jenny doesn't have to dig through the chat to find them. Okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce <clears throat> today's guest. Mark O'Connell is the author of To Be a Machine, which was awarded the 2019 Rooney Prize for Irish Literature and the 2018 Welcome Book Prize. His new book, Notes from an Apocalypse, feels uncannily relevant right now and leaves his reader to wonder, what if the end of the world isn't really the end of the world? Moderating the conversation is Jenny Offal, author of the novels Last Things, Department of Speculation, and most recently, Weather. So please help me welcome to PNP Live, Jenny and Mark. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey guys. Hi. Thank you. Buddy. Hi. So I think we're up and running now. Um, so happy to be here today and get to talk to Mark a little bit about his book. I had a little bit of an uncanny experience with it when I first read it, um, that I basically felt like I was reading uh, the nonfiction version of, of my own novel and that the intersections of interest, the talk about preppers, the interest in kind of questions about community versus questions of individualism, um, I was just so taken with this book that I became a kind of immediate uh, cheerleader for it, telling people to read it. And so it's a real treat to get to talk to Mark today. And I think we're going to start out by having Mark read just a little bit from the beginning of it. That's right. I'm just going to read the first um, maybe two and a half pages or something. Um, thanks, Jane. It was the end of the world, and I was sitting on the couch watching cartoons with my son. It was late afternoon and he was sprawled across my lap, looking at a show about a small Russian peasant girl and the comic scrapes she gets embroiled in with her long-suffering bear companion. I was holding my phone over his head, scrolling downward through my Twitter feed. The bear and the girl were involved in some kind of fishing-based slapstick escapade in which the bear was doing a lot of stumbling about and falling over. My son was giggling happily at this turning his face periodically upward to ensure that I was aware of the amusing pratfalls unfolding on our television screen. On the smaller screen of my phone, I came across an embedded YouTube video on which, precisely because its accompanying text advertised it as soul-crushing and heart-wrenching, I clicked without hesitation. As my son watched his cartoon, I held my phone above his line of vision and watched an emaciated polar bear dragging itself across a rocky terrain falling to its knees and struggling to lift itself again, hauling its tufted carcass onward toward a cluster of rusting metal barrels half filled with trash, from which it eventually managed to pour out what looked like a knuckle of raw bone, more or less totally devoid of meat. The animal was a pathetic sight. Because of the wasting effects of malnutrition, it looked more like a gargantuan stoat or weasel than a polar bear as it slowly chewed whatever it was that, had managed to, that it had managed to scavenge from the trash its eyes half closed in deep and terminal fatigue, a white tide of sal saliva frothed slowly from its mouth, while over this footage a cello played a slow and mournful glissando. I turned down the sound on my phone so as not to attract my son's attention, his inexorable questions. He was three then, and our relationship in those days took the form of an endless interrogation. 
A text at the bottom of the screen explained that the footage was shot near an abandoned Inuit village in the northern Canadian tundra, where the bear had strayed in search of food, the population of seals its usual food source having been drastically diminished by the effects of climate change. My soul remained uncrushed, my heart more or less unwrenched. I felt instead a creeping disgust at the footage itself, at the manner of its presentation, the lacrimose music, the stately pace of the editing, which seemed designed to elicit in me a recognition of my own contribution to this terrible situation, together with a virtuous and perhaps even redemptive swelling of sorrow, of noble sadness at the ecological destruction in which I myself was playing a role. It occurred to me then that the disgust I felt was the symptom of a kind of moral vertigo, resulting from the fact that the very technology that allowed me to witness the final pathetic tribulations of this emaciated beast was in fact a cause of the animal's suffering in the first place. The various rare earth minerals that were mined for the phone's components in places whose name I would never be required to learn, the fuels consumed in the course of its construction, its shipping halfway across the world, its charging with electrical current on a daily basis. It was for the sake of all this, and in my name, that the bear was starving and dragging itself across the rocky ground. The slapstick capering of the cartoon bear my son was watching on the television screen, and above his head, the awful distress of the real bear on the smaller screen. The absurd juxtaposition of these images, simultaneously summoned from the ether and vying for attention, generated a strange emotional charge a surge of shame and sadness at the world my son would be forced to live in, a shame and sadness that I in turn was passing on to him. It seemed to me that I was being confronted with an impossible problem, the problem of reconciling the images on those two screens, or at least of living with the fact of their irreconcilability. The bears in his world were always hanging out with kids and having adventures, living in cabins, enduring comic mishaps, coming good in the end. The bears in mine were all rummaging in bins and starving to death, I wanted him to live in that first world, that good world, as long as possible. But I knew that soon enough he would have to leave it and live in the future. And it was not obvious to me how a person was supposed to raise children, to live and work with a sense of meaning and purpose in the quickening shadow of that future. It didn't take much in those days to set me off on a path towards the end of the world. There were frequent opportunities to indulge my tendency toward the eschatological. Cartoons, viral videos, radio news bulletins, uneasy exchanges with neighbours about how it never used to be this warm in February. So many things felt like a flashback sequence in the first act of a post-apocalyptic movie, like we were living right before the events of the main timeline kicked in. I knew that this kind of thinking was as old as human civilization itself, that imagining the apocalypse was immemorially a response to times of rapid change and uncertainty. This recognition made it no less oppressive, no less real. Great. Um, I was really struck by the fact that at the very beginning of this book, you sort of tackle what I feel like is a question people get a lot that write about anything to do with the end times, which is, haven't people always been saying, this is the end, the end is nigh? Um, you know, mostly people will say, that's just the way people deal with any kind of change. They, they extrapolate that it's all going under, but is there something about this so-called apocalypse that, fe that feels to you different? That feels to you like it's not like the guy on the corner um, ranting about the end of the world? Um, I'm, never, like, I'm, I'm, I'm never able to give a, 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 like a properly kind of definitive answer to this because I've only experienced this one <laughs> apocalypse. <clears throat> it feels like the, the only honest answer is, is yes and no. Because, you know, like I, as I kind of alluded to there, I understand that this is just business as usual. This is like, it's always been the end of the world. It's always like, whenever there's been times of sort of, as I say, rapid change and sort of, um, you know, uncertainty, people just go straight to the apocalyptic kind of mythologies and, and you know, dark imaginings of the future. Um, and there, you know, there've been, you know, periods in recent history where, it could have been the end of the world, you know? Um, our parents' generation, most of them lived through, particularly in the US, you know, the Cold War and the sort of constant threat of the bomb and so on. So those, those were real, those were sort of real, I think, apocalyptic threats. Um, but it seems to me that there's something, uh, something quite 
different about this period we're going through. It's like it's sustained and it feels like there's no one cause, you know? It feels like everything is kind of spinning out of control. It feels like we've got this situation with climate change, um, which in a, in a weird sort of way, we've, we've kind of sidelined a little bit now, you know? Climate change is not something that is on our minds to the same kind of urgent extent as it had been, um, but it's, it feels like it's sort of waiting there still in the background. We're ready to sort of uh, slink back in at any moment. Um, but I, like, I, I think probably the answer to the question is I, I don't believe in the apocalypse, despite having written this book about apocalyptic anxieties and so on. Um, I don't believe in the idea of the end of the world. I think what I believe in is like, um, times of change and, you know, uh, panic that comes with that change and, and you know, the, the difficulty of adjusting to sort of times of difficulty and because most humans have lived in apocalyptic times, you know, um, that's a very rambling and sort of probably unsatisfactory answer. But as you know, it's that, it's that kind of book. <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, I think that, um, that, that one of the things that I noticed in this book is that because it is taking in so many different ideas of things falling apart of the idea of collapse. Mm -hmm. um, but especially with climate change, which seems to me like it was the beginning point um, in many ways for the, the things you're exploring in this book. I don't know if that's accurate, that like the anxieties about climate change were maybe when you were first writing the book at the forefront. Yeah, sure. I mean, like I, I've been anxious and sort of concerned about these things for a long time, but the, the moment that I'm writing about there was really when it like it was it was a period in I guess sort of early to mid 2016 where those kind of anxieties started to come to a head and climate change which had been in the background for so long um started to coalesce with these other things that were happening you know Brexit was happening the rise of the far right Trump getting elected in the US all of these things seem to be happening in the foreground of this looming background of impending climate disaster. And it just, it led to me for a kind of, um, to a kind of, uh, you know, moment of personal crisis that seemed to kind of have this sort of feedback loop going on with the larger crisis in, in the outside world. So I wanted to, like, I wanted to reflect that kind of subjectivity in the beginning of the book because it's there throughout I mean it is a book about the outside world it's a book in which I encounter lots of different kinds of people and you know people who are preparing for the end of the world and it is in most kind of uh sort of significant ways a work of journalism but I wanted to sort of honor that starting point of subjectivity because you know that's what gives it all kind of shape and and urgency, I think, in a way, was that it did begin in this moment of like, looking at my son and thinking, what are the stakes, you know, what, what, what have I done in a way by, you know, bringing this person into the world? It's, and it's, it strikes me now, I haven't read it in a while, I haven't read um, aloud from the book in a while. That like, it, it strikes me now as a slightly eccentric choice to begin with that, because it's quite like, it's a very dark moment, I think, you know, the book is, um, at times, I hope funny, but that's a, a very dark moment to begin in. Uh, and of course, you know, when you do events like this, you always have to read from the beginning of the book, or that seems to be the most straightforward. <laughs> so I always um, find to reassure, reassure people that the book is funny. Yeah. Well, it is very funny. And I, I think that um, I thought that it was an eccentric, but also kind of brilliant choice that you foregrounded that whole idea of like concern, your subjective concern, and also your idea of like complicity in this, that this isn't some far off thing that's happening to other people or that you feel you have you know no involvement with um but what as the book goes on as you go as you go into the more journalistic part um you do start visiting all these different places where you know people for example are uh buying up these bunkers to live in um if the their version of the doomsday comes or you you why don't you talk a little bit about some of the different places you decided to go to kind of be places almost like repositories for these kinds of anxieties of what yeah I mean that's a good way of of thinking about it I suppose I, I did try to find places that were yeah repositories of the anxieties that I was feeling and I I mean this sounds like a very sort of uh you know self-centered and narcissistic way of approaching uh, you know a non-fiction book about about the world but I wanted to find things in the outside world that seemed to me to be reflections of internal states that I was going through. 
Um, so, and, and that's not difficult, I think. Most of us experience uh, the world or like the news, for want of a better term, uh, in ways where that sort of the line between subjectivity and, you know, the outside world is, is kind of blurry and, you know, uh, troublingly kind of um, porous. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to find places that um, that felt like they were sort of channeling those anxieties um, of the time. So, uh, and it, in a way, like so the choices, you know, could seem quite arbitrary, um, but there were things that I felt um, did that for me. And, and, you know, one of the things was, yeah, so I, I went to um, visit a, uh, a, a apocalypse survival compound in, in South Dakota. Um, I went to Chernobyl. Um, I went to uh, a Mars colonization conference in uh, Los Angeles with all these sort of uh, enthusiasts of the idea that, you know, because this planet is completely fucked, we need to, you know, set up a colony on Mars and so on. Very, very popular um, in the Silicon Valley crowd. Let's just yeah, forget another yeah. planet. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in some ways, I mean, I guess like a good half of the book is about America really, or at least the stories that I encounter and the people I encounter are, you know, uh, just by necessity embedded in American culture. So in some ways it is a book about America because America is like, um, for a nonfiction writer, it's, it, you know, it's it's a series of, you know, gifts really in a way because it's such <laughs> many, Because such of the, uh, the batshit crazy quality of, of American. Right. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to ignore, you know? Yeah. Um, but also, I think, you know, aside from that, um, it's a it's a culture that is embedded in a way in certain uh, apocalyptic ideas, you know, it's um, in its beginnings and in its kind of mythology and in its kind of sense of itself. There is an apocalypticism that's sort of very close to the surface in, in American culture in a way that's a bit deeper down in, in Europe, I think. Right. I mean, we have a secretary of state who, who believes in waiting in for the rapture and it informs his uh his policy making so i mean i think you're right that it's like you don't even you don't even have to dig at all to get to it especially with this administration right. um, now when you were researching the different places to to go um did you go in that order that you do in the book i mean did you go first to south dakota and uh then no, I didn't. Um, I kind of took things as, as they came. Actually, the first thing I did for the book was the sort of the long sort of centerpiece in the middle of the book where I go to Allerdale Wilderness Reserve in yeah. Scotland. And uh, I mean, that chapter is a bit of an outlier, but that was the, the first thing that I did for the book. And that, that's the chapter where I just um, sort of hang out on a mountainside in uh, the Scottish Highlands for uh, 10 days and spend 24 hours just sitting by myself. Um, which, you know, in a way is a bit of a tough sell for a book about apocalyptic anxieties and the end of the world. Uh, but that was the first thing that I did. And, and in a way, like the, the concept for the book kind of coalesced in that time, um, because I wanted to, you know, in a way I was writing about, you know, climate change is such a big aspect of the book, but I was writing about, you know, the death of nature and what, what the sort of um, uh, cost of our sort of broken down relationship with the natural world have been. And I kind of realized at a certain point that I don't have a relationship with the natural world. Like I'm a, I'm a city person and I'm sort of, yeah. at that point was quite happy being that way. And I sort of realized that, you know, maybe I should try and have quote unquote an encounter with nature. <laughs> so I did this it's thing. funny because you chose to do it by, uh, under the auspices of the Dark Mountain Collective, which I also went on one of those yeah. retreats with pretty much yeah. the same idea that, oh wait, I'm writing about nature, but I, I keep my distance from it. But one of the things you said earlier about like not exactly believing in the apocalypse per se, you know, the Dark Mountain, which I don't know, can you just say a few words about what Dark Mountain Collective is? Yeah, Dark Mountain is this, um, I mean, it's international, I suppose, or at least, um, you know, across the English speaking world, but it's, it's uh, essentially a, an English organization which was started by, um, a really interesting writer named Paul Kingsnorth uh, and another uh, journalist named Dougald Hind back, I suppose, like 10 or 12 years ago now. Um, it's quite controversial and quite extreme um, in its sort of attitude towards climate change and the problems that we face because of it. But it's basically, in some quite straightforward ways, quite an apocalyptic kind of uh, movement. It's a movement of artists and sort of uh, writers and thinkers and so on. But their basic premise is that 
we've already passed the point of no return with climate change. Um, the damage is done and we need to stop talking about, you know, conversations around sustainability and, you know, uh, carbon swapping and all these kinds of ideas and, you know, sustainable consumption and so on, because it's, it's happening, it's coming, it's already here. What we need to do is talk about how we're going to live with it and how we're going to change the way we live and how we're going to change our cultures and so on. So like, it's a really uh, dark and uh, quite provocative uh, sort of conversation that they've been having for the last 10 years. Uh, a lot of it is really interesting. A lot of it is uh, difficult to get on board with, to say the least. Um, but they also organized these um, sort of, uh, or they did at the time, kind of regular uh, retreats where people get together and talk about these problems and in a, in a quite earnest and, uh, you know, um, like serious way, uh, and in a quite hippie -ish way, getting people to go off into the countryside and sort of sit around in circles and, and talk about these, these things. So in a way, I was really intrigued by it and really drawn to it. And also I was really cynical about it. And part of the um, sort of trajectory of that chapter is me trying to sort of break down that sort of carapace of cynicism around these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, that was my sort of journey with, with Dark Mountain. Well, because I mean, the Dark Mountain Manifesto, you know, one of the things that I think the last line of it is uh, the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world full stop. Yeah. And, um, and they talk about how, you know, our idea as Westerners or privileged Westerners about, you know, what's going to be the end of the world is actually maybe the conditions that a lot of people are already living in in different parts of the world. Um, so on the one hand, like people can say, oh, it's very nihilistic. And on the other hand, it's sort of saying, okay, what if society as we know it or civilization as we know it collapses? Um, and it's an interesting to have that in the middle of the book because all around it are, um, I think the Cher Chernobyl chapter also does that, like people living with ruin, living with collapse. But then mm -hmm. when it comes to the uh, billionaires in New Zealand, making their compounds or the people in South Dakota who want to have these, it's a very different idea. It's an idea that you could survive it uh, with just having the right things, having the right place, having enough stuff. So how did you feel like uh, in terms of the different parts of the book about the tension between sort of like people that were more like, yes, collapse is happening and more the other ones that were thinking we have the potential to stave it off if we if we choose the right places to live etc yeah i mean i guess in some ways in a way that's similar to what i've been saying about you know finding things in the outside world that's reflected my inner states in some ways like it's not a polemical book and it's not a book in which i stage arguments as such i don't think but there is a kind of a um, a loose and uh, sort of vague argument going on between different accounts of the end of the world and different ways that, you know, apocalyptic scenarios might be negotiated that's going on through these various people and their sort of strategies for dealing with it. Um, so, you know, I look a lot in the book at these sort of um, quite extremist libertarian visions of preparing for the end of the world and I think what that did for me, the reason why I was so interested in, in people like Peter Thiel, the idea that Peter Thiel is buying up land in, in the South Island in New Zealand and, you know, people creating sort of uh, privatized states or offering the provision of kind of um, security states in South Dakota or whatever for surviving times of like, you know, violence and civil unrest and so on, was that those ideas seemed like in a way like extreme metaphors, like these big sort of grand, um, almost ludicrous sort of manifestations of things that are already the case in our society, I think. Um, so something like Peter Thiel, uh, you know, buying a, a, a compound in, in New Zealand and sort of preparing to retreat there in the event of the end of the world, it, it works as a kind of, um, metaphor for the way that things already are, I think. And so that's what drew me to it. In the way that like a science fiction writer or something would find these sort of big overarching overblown metaphors. I think that increasingly is sort of how I tend to work as a nonfiction writer as well. Right, you didn't have to make that one up. I mean, that that metaphor for inequity. Yeah. <laughs> buy up the water supply and yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're giving that one right to you. Now, why did you decide to go to Chernobyl? What was what was the thinking about that? Um, well, I was really interested in uh, the way that we imagine the end of the world and the sort of fetishization of ruins, I think, is a really interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, and Chernobyl, uh, aside from being the site of a like very real and very recent and very terrible disaster, is also a kind of ground zero for this um, aestheticization of apocalypse. Um, and I was really interested in that. And, and also just the sort of connected idea of apocalypse tourism, of, you know, catastrophe tourism, of paying money and going to a place to see what the end of the world might look like. So as well as being a real place with a real history that's, you know, very disturbing and very recent, Chernobyl is also like a vision of the future. I think that's part of the attraction of the thing and the sort of dark appeal of it is that you can go there and you can imagine walking through a world without people. I don't know if you remember, there's a book that came out about 10 or 12 years ago the called the, the World Without Us. Yeah. yeah, I think it was probably a big hit in the US. Yeah. Think, yeah. Um, and they even made a they even made it made a very cheesy um, TV show off of it called like the day after and it would it would show how everything would fall apart because the premise of that book of course which is a sort of ingenious thought experiment is forget how it happens just one day there's no humans right and then how does what falls apart what thrives all those different kinds of things yeah um, yeah and, and uh, you know, kind of a test case for that in a way and I think that's why not just me, but people are attracted to it. And so I went there and, um, you know, in, in, a way, in a way that is slightly shameful, uh, sort of used it as a way to grapple with my own uh, sort of ethical uh, sort of struggle about my even being there in the first place. I mean, that, that seems to me, like now that I look back on it, like the real drama of that part of the book is me like, trying to have this argument with myself about whether I should be there or not. Right. Um, no, that comes through. Uh, that definitely comes through. And yeah. what did you feel like you saw when you were there? I mean, sometimes when people talk about that, the, the zone, they talk about how obviously there's less people. So certain parts of nature have come back in a, in a more sort of dramatic way. Um, there's a really funny scene where he's, you're talking to one of the guys there and he's noticing that there's asbestos in there and you know, you realize it's not the greatest thing to be walking through these ruined buildings that are full of that, but he's sort of dismissive in this really funny Russian way of like, oh, people worry about that instead of the radiation. Yeah. Um, when yeah. one is basically just a slower form of death than the other, yeah. who knows? Yeah. Um, and I think I, the thing that I realized in that moment was that the asbestos was like a very real and present danger, whereas the radiation was more kind of vague and, you know, it's been cleaned up really effectively over the last 20 years or whatever. But asbestos is a whole other situation. So, yeah, exactly, it's just like yeah. Really sublime to the mundane or whatever. I thought there were so many funny parts in that section because there's the there's the beer, the Chernobyl beer, which is made specifically with wheat, not from around there and water, not from around there. I mean, it feels like this sort of... Um, ingenious but also craziness of the human mind of like how to work its way around disaster and kind, right. of, kind of come up with something yeah. i mean that kind of was my initial reason for wanting to go there like the sort of the my approach to it changed when i was there and you know after i came back i wrote about it in a slightly different way but that was the sort of main reason why i wanted to go in the first place because i found it really fascinating that this place had had this like unbelievable catastrophe happened. And yet 30, whatever years later, um, businesses are springing up. People are making money out of it. And, you know, not, I, I wouldn't want to judge that because I think it's in a way, it's kind of amazing that, you know, people are setting up tours in, in Kiev and they'll bring you there and they're finding ways to make money. And, you know, people are even living there again and, you know, living off the land. And that was really interesting to me. Um, but in particular, the, the tourism thing, this idea of like, um, you know, people making money out of the idea of the apocalypse. And of course, the irony that I've started to sort of not be able to ignore since the book came out is that I've kind of become one of these people who has capitalized on, on apocalyptic anxieties. But yeah. Well, um, I mean, it feels like you talk kind of about the role of capital throughout the book, though, that it's the thing that's um, 
that is underlying a lot of these these questions, whether it's about people trying to protect what they see as theirs, as their resources, the kind of lifeboat ethics, where it's like only me and my people are getting this lifeboat and everyone else, we're gonna push off the side. But I mean, obviously since you wrote the book, um, besides climate change, there's been the pandemic, there have been these worldwide protests about inequity and for racial justice. And, you know, I know that in my mind, so much of it feels like it's really all connected together, that, that this fear that people have, I think, whether they consciously are thinking about climate change or not, seems to have uh, caused a lot of this us versus them mentality um, and the extreme inequity. But I'm just wondering, like, you must have been asked lots of questions since the pandemic about how that how you know did you did you feel like anything you look you learned about in this book made you prepared for this particular uh apocalypse we ended up having i always say that was not the one i was you know <laughs> yeah. looking for. no I, I mean the short and very disappointing answer is no i learned nothing that was of any use to me um, <laughs> putting it in the book uh you know despite spending all that time with preppers and like looking at prepper videos and you know you, you know all about this stuff um I don't think I learned anything useful from it. You know, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I, there was a moment like before the lockdown here when the pandemic seemed like it was really, you know, it was just unavoidably coming and there was a, all these anxieties. And it was the same in the US, obviously there were all these anxieties about the supply chains and, you know, whether we were gonna have food on the shelves in the supermarkets this time next week or even in two days time or whatever. There was a moment then where I remember having a conversation with my wife where it was like, should we, by what should we buy should we get like a bunch of lentils should we like stockpile canned goods we live in a really small house we have a lot of room to stockpile things yeah. so we're kind of like we're, we're already kind of the fridge is already full it's a small fridge i don't know what to do but i remember like you know taking down because i bought a bunch of books about sort of practical guides to prepping or whatever and taking yeah. them down and flicking through them and kind of thinking might be some useful stuff in here maybe i should approach them with something other than like the ironic distance that I have <laughs> yeah. planted them with um but no I didn't yeah I never went that far um and there was I, nothing in there that was that was that was useful I'm sure there was lots of useful things but I'm just not a very I'm not wired that way you know yeah. um I'm yeah I'm not I'm not in any way a practical person I'm, and luckily you know I got away with it this time I got away with it <laughs> but it's, I mean yeah I have been asked a lot about you know the because when the book came out um it you know the conversation uh at the time about the book was how timely it was and you know you know did he plan this pandemic to promote the book and i'm sure you had yours a bit earlier but it, there was a similar kind of conversation i guess around yours but uh you know like it was you know timeliness is obviously something everyone wants to a certain degree particularly non-fiction writers but um i i mean in a way it couldn't have come at a worse time because yeah. obviously bookstores were closed and all that kind of stuff um but also, you know, climate change is such a big aspect of the book. Uh, and it is a book about the apocalypse and, ap and various kinds of apocalyptic anxieties. Uh, but it just ha happens to sort of gloss over um, the, the one apocalypse that actually did come along at the time <laughs> the book was published. So, you know, there's a couple of mentions of viral pandemics, but really it's not something that I, you know, yeah. I sort of nodded in the direction of, you know, of course, viral pandemics, but, you know, yeah. not, not in any <laughs> sustained way. So, I mean, that's been interesting. I mean, in some ways, like, luckily, I think people have sort of overlooked that and discussed it as though it is uh, eerily relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but my mm -hmm. sense of it at the time is that, well, this book could not be more obsolete. This is just like the most, you know, the most obsolete it's possible for a book to be. And, and now, um, this is all great stuff to be saying at a, an event for your book, by the way. Um, <laughs> I should be stopping you, but yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I, but yeah. I, if, I, I think person, in a way, I, though, there's something, I mean, people think, oh, they want to read to escape when, when things are so uh, diff difficult. But I also feel like reading about all these kind of dark things and reading about them it's such a funny book at the same time that for me it's it's very cathartic to like be going down all these apocalyptic rabbit holes but also like the characters that you're coming across and hearing the kind of absurdity of the way most of us because a lot of a lot of prepper stuff is about the the kind of false belief that you can somehow control 
um, these things that you can somehow, if you do this, if you do that, if you have enough toilet paper, if you have enough lentils, um, <laughs> you, you are going to be spared. Um, and and uh, others will be ravaged by the horrible maw of the world, but not you. And so I feel like um, what I really liked about, you know, where the book ended up is it sort of, it, you, the question, which I guess has been, you know, haunting you since the beginning of the book in this passage you read, which is, was I right to bring children into the world knowing what I know? And then by the end of it, um, I think the parts of the book that to me were the most um, beautiful were these moments that kind of have this sudden, like almost bird's eye view. You have it in the dark mountain section when she talks about humans maybe making beautiful fossils. And I feel like you have it when you talk about your children, because you talk about them as these sort of singular beings, like experiencing like joy and mm. excitement. Your daughter's very excited to hear any song with her name in it. Mm. And I feel like it, it, that's what I love about the book is that it, 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 can, it traverses so much emotional territory from the very um, frightening to the very funny, but to also, I think the, the very, moving by the end and that's um that's why i think people should read this book even though we're, we're in the middle of a global pandemic because i think ultimately you know i get questions a lot of times about hope and despair and somehow those two terms aren't that useful to me but um i was wondering if by the end of this book how did you feel like you your anxieties or your thoughts had changed um I'm definitely in a better place than I was when I started writing the book. Um, and I got to that place, I think through writing the book, or at least it coincided with the period in which I was writing the book. So like the emotional sort of trajectory for want of a better term in the book is, I think genuinely reflective of what I was going through in the time that I was writing it. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I think, I mean, there's been lots of different reactions to the book from like too terrifying, too upsetting, to like not serious enough to, you know, but the, the most common one has been people have found it um, comforting is the word that a lot of people use, which That's I just, I felt. yeah. And I like, I, I, I get, I know where people are coming from, but uh, it, it seems like a strange way to be, but I, I think I get it because like, you know, what I went through when I was writing the book was, I think there's a compressed experience of that for the reader maybe, because, yeah. you know, the bit that I read at the beginning, like that's a real moment that is representative also of like a much longer time in my life where everything just seemed to be going to shit and the world seemed to be going to shit. And, you know, I just felt very guilty about having kids and, you know, the future and all these kinds of things. And so I wrote into that anxiety as a way I think of writing out of it. Not that I don't have anxieties anymore. It's not like it was some kind of therapeutic exercise and I'm now in like this Zen cloud or whatever. But the trajectory I think was from that like really intense anxiety through encountering all these sort of manifestations of the apocalyptic energies of our time and all these people who are convinced that the world is gonna end, including myself at various times, um, through to I think just kind of coming through that and that like the birth of my second child uh our daughter was like a real moment in terms of that that came um towards the end of the time when I was recording the book um and in a way that seems maybe counterintuitive given all the anxieties that I've talked about that was a really like kind of redemptive period in a way um for me uh and I hope people around me maybe because I was less you know, dark and, and anxious in that time. Um, but I also think that, and this maybe is a slightly strange and sort of um, counterproductive thing to admit for a writer, but I think that emotional trajectory had a lot to do with the fact of getting to the end of writing the book, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. The leak that you feel on the page at the end of the book yeah. is, you know, in large part, the relief of me having finished the fucking thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, I think, you know, uh, that's, I guess, like I'm still there anyway. I, I, you know, I went through it and it was a really difficult, the book 
to write. It was a, like, it took a long, longer certainly than I had expected it to. And, you know, there was a bit of a, I guess, emotional toll and, you know, having all these things circling around my head and, you know, um, it was fun in, in lots of ways as well, but I was glad to be done with it. And that's yeah. the thing on the page. Um, well, I want to turn to get a few of the questions from the, uh, from the audience too, but I would be remiss given that we are also doing this as part of an Irish event. I'm curious about, um, sort of, uh, does this, what was the response to this book in Ireland? And did you, do you feel like it's a particularly Irish book or that you can feel like influences of Irish writers in it while you were writing it? Um, it's it's an interesting question. Like I, I, I know, like I, I, I don't feel like I'm in conversation with any particular Irish books in this book, but I know that there, like there are lots of Irish writers who I, I'm just unavoidably influenced by in terms of like how I express myself and the, the sort of ways that I sort of um, go through sentences. Um, I mean, this might seem slightly surprising, but John Banville is like a huge person for me. Yeah. Um, I did a PhD on Banville's fiction and, you know, I spent four years doing nothing but reading Banville and that's been internalized to a huge extent. So I can sort of- that in the sentences. I, well, I mean, I, I, that would be an extremely flattering thing for me to accept, but okay. I think- <laughs> You don't have to accept it. I'm, 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 I'm saying yeah. I can- yeah, no, I think, I, I think, you know, I'm like, he's someone whose presence I'm definitely uh, aware of. Um, yeah, um, but it, like Ireland is uh, like, obviously has an extremely rich history and present in terms of um, writing, uh, but there isn't a huge tradition of the kind of nonfiction that I write. There's now like lots of essay writers, like really interesting essay writers. Um, but there's not a huge tradition of like sort of literary nonfiction in the sort of like journalistic mode. Right. Um, so I think I'm probably more influenced by, you know, American writers in that mm -hmm. sense. Okay, good. Um, all right, let's see if I can get some questions here. Um, all right. Has the last six months changed your assessment of New Zealand in any way? Post COVID, are we likely to see more Peter Thales seeking citizenship, citizenship there? Well, the important thing to say about that is that very shortly after I left New Zealand, around the time I was writing the chapter, uh, the new, then quite new government of Jacinda Ardern changed the laws around foreign ownership of land because it was a big conversation that was happening at the time, largely to do with sort of reporting around Peter Thiel buying up a property and also lots of sort of um, Chinese investors coming in from the outside and buying up land. Um, so it's now much more difficult for wealthy foreigners to buy up chunks of New Zealand. Um, but I think the sort of path that New Zealand has been on, particularly with, yeah, with the virus, you would imagine that it's a very attractive place for people to. Yeah, to I think people are still going to try. <laughs> I, I, mean, I couldn't even post my book to to New Zealand. I couldn't even put it in the mail to. Oh, really? They don't. They don't want have, it. They don't want anything from outside. I mean, maybe that's changed since, and I'm just being lazy, having not posted my book. Oh to my outside. gosh! Wow. Yeah, it's like it's a very yeah, it's a very closed shop. Yeah. Um, let's see. Not long ago, it seemed like people pushing the ideas of an impending apocalypse were perceived as loonies. Based upon your observations that the Mars Colonization Group and the South Dakota Group, are such people becoming more mainstream and less crazy? No, that's um, <laughs> I, th I think we're, we've all gone a bit sort of apocalyptic the last yeah. while. I mean, it's interesting. It's sort of like it exists in this sort of, um, the conversation exists in this sort of, no man's land between irony and sort of genuine urgent sincerity when people talk about the apocalypse um but it goes back to like i guess it's you know it's not the end of the world you know we we refer to the apocalypse that we're going through now but you know uh to sort of you know link back to what you're saying about the dark mountain people and the idea that our idea of the end of the world is uh you know just how sort of 70% of the planet lives. What we're going through right now is weird, but it, you know, it's still an extremely good deal in the global context. But I think, you know, um, 
people like preppers and so on. There was a moment, I think, around when the book came out and the pandemic was really sort of taking off where it seemed like preppers were justified, where they'd been sort of vindicated by uh, what was happening. But, you know, and I've talked about this a bit, I guess, but it seems to me that <clears throat> they're sort of radically individualist sort of um, methodology of getting through times like this has been shown up, I think, you know, um, it's, it's no way to deal with times of chaos, you know, is um, just battening down the hatches and, and looking after your own stuff. It d doesn't work. I don't think it works for individuals and it certainly doesn't work for societies in, in the larger sense. It's certainly not how humans have, have made it through things in the past. I mean, they've adapted by forming groups. And I think one of the, the good things that I saw with the pandemic was like the mutual aid societies springing up in different places or the solidarity groups that were forming around um, the protests here and that sort of thing. So right. yeah, let's see what else here. Um, okay. The book includes, this is true, it's very, very funny. Uh, this book includes a brilliantly funny riff on Steven Pinker's hair and his enlightened optimism. Enlightened is in uh, quotation marks. How does your own worldview differ from his? And is this in any way reflected in your own hair? Mm, it's a good question. It's um, an excellent question. That's the best question I've seen as a moderator. I, imagine um, I would have thought about this, that I would have like, you know, uh, turned that conceptual hair apparatus <laughs> upon my uh, but I haven't. Um, I, you know, I guess I'm like a sort of a recovered pessimist. So I don't know. Maybe like I don't know how that is reflected in my hair. Um, for those, anyone who hasn't seen Steven Pinker, he has these masses of kind of gray, curly hair, really? which is uh, yeah. I think it's optimist hair. Uh, yeah. But it's also very groovy. He looks very much like he's, you know, going to invite you into a hot tub or something. Right. I mean, my, my sort of take on Pinker's hair specifically was that it looks like um, one of those 18th century like periwigs. Is that the term periwigs? Yeah, yeah, periwig. Um, and he's like obviously a big enlightenment sort of rationalist guy. So he's like kind of harking back to those values. <laughs> it's like, you know, people come to look like their dogs, I think. Yeah, Latin, exactly. Some of the hair yeah. of 18th century enlightenment thinkers, maybe. You've got that short, ready to go, grab your go bag kind of hair yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um yes okay let's see um did you read octavia butler's parable of the sowers she was ahead of her time with her dystopian novels i have not read octavia butler actually um i, I did like you know I, I did a similar thing with with my first book with to be a machine which is about you know transhumanists and you know people who want to use technology to live forever and so on and you know i'm a bit of an ignoramus when it comes to science fiction um I haven't read all that much sci-fi and you know I've had people give me kind of reading lists of of books and I've read bits and pieces but um you know you would imagine that because so many of those ideas came from you know Octavia Butler is like a, a big person in that sort of realm as well but no shamefully I haven't I haven't read um her books I haven't read all that much apocalyptic fiction in general actually yeah uh, which yeah, is strange yeah. given given my sort of preoccupations but there you go yeah, I mean, I remember I did I did read Parable of the Sowers and I, um, I I taught it and I remember that many years after I taught it, there's a scene that she has where it's like about the inequity of this dystopian society and there's fires burning and all the rich people have their own private fire brigades. And I remember when we were having some fires two years ago in the California hills and it was like, I, I just learned that that thing now existed that people had rich people now had their own fire brigades. And it was kind of like Octavia Butler, got it again. <laughs> it's incredible, yeah. Frightening. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see, did the process of researching and writing the book make you more optimistic, more pessimistic, or did you pretty much end up where you started? I think, I think we, I actually asked you that. Um, how about this one? In terms of chaos, it seems like things just keep ramping up, COVID, social unrest, the rise of fascism around the world, most alarmingly in America, massive weather events. Moving forward, do you think this is a moment we move through and reestablish some sense of calm, even while battling climate change, or do things just keep continuing to spiral? Hmm. In other words, are we having a moment, or is this just the start of a long-term state? 
Well, I'd love to say that, you know, uh, I think we're going to sort of get through this moment of weirdness and uh, get out the other side and, you know, all learn from it and, you know, hope, hug each other. Hope, and... hope. Give us hope, yeah. <laughs> Well, so, uh, you know, I'm not without hope. I'm definitely, I do have hope, but it, it's a hope that we can adjust to the chaos and the darkness. And I think we will do that. I think that's what, that's what, you know, um, successful societies do but I don't I don't think we can avoid it I don't think we're going to uh you know we might we might be able to mitigate the worst effects of climate change but I think it's going to be you know we're not going to we're not going to go around it we're going to go through it and we're going to find ways to live with it and there's going to be a lot of suffering um and I don't think we're going to get through it in a sense it'll just be the context in which we have to live and we'll learn to live with it I think yeah um, okay, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, let's see. Um, uh, are there any points that are helpful to keep in your forefront when writing from the middle of a catastrophe? Were there any sort of um, things that you thought about as a writer about, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about how the beginning of your book is in some ways it's kind of unusual, like you you, from the very beginning kind of talk about the emotional investment and stakes and layer that in right at the beginning instead of say taking us right into the wacky world of the preppers mm. um so i think the the question that this person's asking is about like did you have any particular strategies knowing that you were writing about something so dark like to kind of yeah i mean so I think, you know, humor is useful in a way, like I never wanted to lose sight of this sort of absurdity and funniness of a lot of this stuff. It's not like a tactic as such, because it just, it, it is just a sensibility. It is just a, like a way of seeing things and expressing yourself. But I think, um, you know, it was important never to like, like go too deep into the darkness without losing sight of, you know, how funny all of this stuff is even at its darkest you know um but also i think like the big thing was never to sort of spiral too much into abstraction um, mm -hmm. and to keep sort of bringing things home i mean the, like in a very obvious and sort of literal sense that's what i do in both of my books really is like take these ideas which are in some ways like quite abstract ideas the, the end of the world the apocalypse and you know the future of humanity and technology and these things and i i have to kind of metabolize those big things through my small world as like just a person who lives in Dublin and has a family and mm -hmm. you know just walks around a fairly mundane life like that I have to sort of keep this um sort of interchange going between the personal and the sort of outer sort of political worlds and that just seems to me to be a natural thing to do um but I always try to um do it in a way that like um doesn't lose sight of myself in these mm -hmm. broad kind of things so yeah that's quite a rambling sort of way of expressing something that is difficult to i guess uh put a tight frame on but that seems to be how i work yeah no i think that that seems like how it's gonna work. okay let's see um what surprised you most from meeting these people are they more frightened of civilization ending or upset that it hasn't happened yet? Mm. That is, I think I would have to say mostly the second. I mean, whether they, whether they actually want civilization to end or not is another question, but it seems to me to be much more of a fantasy than a fear, this idea of the apocalypse. Um, particularly when you talk about, you know, preppers and, you know, people who are sort of, building luxury survival compounds in the middle of nowhere or whatever. Um, that seems to me to be much more about a fantasy of how it might be possible to live without the sort of structures of society in place around you. And in a, in a lot of ways, it's <clears throat> because it's such a male kind of milieu. All yeah, you're the all powerful patriarch, you know, like scanning the horizon for threats. It feels very informed by movies and. Right. And you can see it. You, you can, I mean, again, with, you know, American culture and what's going on in, in the streets in America, you can see the sort of the ways that like 
people's sort of masculinist sort of chauvinistic fantasies bleed into reality in this really horrible tragic way i mean i guess i don't have to go into too many specifics but you can see these like fantasies playing out in, in very real kind of horrific ways um, yeah. and i think not to sort of tar the preppers necessarily with that exact brush but um it does seem to be a fantasy of sort of violent self-sufficiency i think yeah well and it's it's such a contrast to like the woman you meet at dark mountain um the one who said to think about you know what would humans look like as fossils because what she's she's talks about how how wrong that idea is of, of building barricades and that you're only going to be you, the only thing you can do is, is make yourself indispensable with the you know the knowledge you have to help other people and she knows every the use of every you know herb and she's she's somebody who's like accumulated all of this natural knowledge um which mm. strikes me as like very opposite of this um guns and ammo approach yeah yeah all right um, i'm sorry if i'm skipping anyone um let's see uh there's a question about we talked a little bit about your I irish influences um who are your uh american influences um, Delillo's mentioned in the question. Mm, yeah, Delillo is definitely like a huge person for me. Obviously, he's a fiction writer, but um, I think he kind of, he's just one of these people who um, kind of looms very large for me. And <clears throat> when I think about like the things that I'm obsessed with, he's one of those people who's been there and sort of done it and, and yeah. written about it in, in uh, ways that I sort of uh, continually draw from. In terms of like... Yeah, what year uh, did White Noise come out? <laughs> yeah, I guess like, you know, what, 1984 or something like that? 1985? Yeah, like that, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the epigraph of my first book is from White Noise. Um, and I read, like, I've read it probably as many, as many times as I've read any book at this point. Um, but it still seems to be like he just nails those apocalyptic anxieties and the anxieties about death and the way in which the anxiety about apocalypse is is always in some ways a personal anxiety about your own mortality as well and you know yeah. it just does it in this really funny sort of incredibly sharp way um yeah so he's, he's so good at just taking a little tiny moment too and like he it's like at one point he has his son it says he ate a winter peach and you just like, you know, you see how he, even little every object he kind of infuses with that like creepiness and uncanniness. Yeah, yeah, so. really. Um, I'm trying, I mean, I always find this question difficult. You know, when you get asked about influences, you immediately can't think of any writers, you know, all of a sudden. Oh, I know, me too. It's like, I've never read a book when I'm asked. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Bookshelves. Um, um, yeah. Let's see. All right, I'll, I'll let you off the hook here. Let's see. Um, uh any thoughts on what it means to think and hope politically when it does seem the world as we've known it is basically over well and that's followed by what brings you hope so we're circling back we're circling back to this idea again yeah what brings me hope well it's let's put it this way like when you think of because people are also curious if you started another book or if you are able to write during lockdown. So I'm going to kind of mush these into one question, which is that um, what is kind of giving you some kind of emotional charge right now that's making you interested in things outside of the apocalyptic? Yeah, um, I, I guess a couple of things. Uh, my family, definitely, like just hanging out with my kids, often a source of extreme frustration and you know uh sort of claustrophobia but also just like endless joy as well at the same time um the other thing i've done recently is uh i've got really into like just cycling going for going <laughs> i'm only laughing because i've I, that seems to be something that um that's saving a lot of people right now i'm noticing like a lot yeah, of yeah, I mean, I you buy a bike because so many people have just decided they're going to buy bikes but yeah. yeah, I sort of started to like explore Dublin a little bit and like on my bike and it's like, it's a, it's still weird, you know, it's, it's still quite empty and sort of dead in a lot of ways, but I've really enjoyed uh, just cycling around the city and sort of, you know, locking my bike and walking around. And that's connected to a thing that I'm writing at the moment, which is sort of like um, another thing that's sort of giving me sort of energy right now, which is this project that I'm working on at the moment about it. <clears throat> I won't say too much about it, but it's like, uh, it's about a sort of a very famous Irish um, 
murder case and political scandal that happened when I was a kid. Um, and the person who's behind it is sort of, is out there, he's out, he's out, um, out of prison the last few years. And I've been kind of obsessed with this person for uh, quite a long time. So um, yeah, there's a bit of sort of, um, sort of walking around the city and cycling around the city in this, uh, in this book. Um, so all these like, in, I guess in a way that always tends to happen with me, the stuff that I'm just doing in my life bleeds into, bleeds into it, yeah. the obsession that's at the center of the work as well. Um, right. so, yeah. um, well, I think we're sort of coming to the end of our, of our hour, but um, this was really great. Thank you so much for Thanks being for part doing. of this and talking to us and um, sorry to badger you with so many questions about hope. <laughs> But you know, actually, I feel like um, this book has uh, has a lot of everything in it, and um, I'm excited to to read your next one. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks so much Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you guys both for being here. Um, as soon as we end this event, I'm going to go donate to save the polar bears because now I am so sad. <laughs> so everyone, go do that. Um, I have dropped the links to buy Jenny and Mark's books in the chat, and I'll follow up with an email. Um, but thank you all so much for being here and have a great Friday and a good weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks.